So today I am going to be reading and responding to your Yu-Gi-Oh! hot takes. I asked people to leave the most controversial, spicy ones they could, and we're going to be reading and deciding if they're good or bad. Or like, maybe? I don't know. Fair warning, I asked for hot takes, so there will definitely be some controversial things, I'm sure. Let's get started. People that hate X summoning mechanic don't actually hate them, they just hate the power creep that can happen at that era, and then they just put the blame on the summoning type instead of the game itself. Hmm, interesting. Let me marinate on this. I think this person raises a really good point. If you think about like when certain summoning mechanics begin and end, it does tend to pretty closely align with like a big power creep point in Yu-Gi-Oh itself. So for instance, when I look at maybe uh, the end of Synchro's era and like the beginning of Xyz monsters, that was around the time that we got cards like Tour Guide from the Underworld and uh, Rescue Rabbit, more or less. Like they were out, but you know what I mean. Like they promoted Xyz summoning more than they promoted Synchro summoning, but they were also kind of the whole one monster immediately turns into two thing that didn't exactly exist in the Synchro era. And so it could be easy to conflate that power creep with just Xyz ruining the game at that period of time. And I suppose the same can be said of Pendulums, because like when Pendulum came out, well, that's, it's a tricky story because I you know people don't like Pendulums just because they're like complicated and two effects and all that stuff. But truthfully, Pendulums weren't even actually like super duper busted when they first came out. It was more so just the fact that we got things like Burning Abyss and Shadal that really turned the whole floating archetype on its head where like they just floated for pretty much everything it felt like. And that was sort of a type of power creep we hadn't seen in Yu-Gi-Oh! And so it would be easy to think, well, Pendulums coming out were in the game, but really maybe just that bit of power creep at that period of time was what ruined it for you. So I think it's certainly a valid take and I don't disagree with it. So thumbs up. Konami should unban everything for a format and rebuild their ban list from the ground up. Woo, okay. Believe it or not, I actually don't think this is the worst thing. So the thing about the Yu-Gi-Oh! ban list is that it has existed for most of the game's, you know, lifespan, but what got a card banned in 2004 or five isn't really the same as what would get a card banned in like 2009 or 10. And also what would get a card banned in 2024. It's kind of this moving target, ever-changing thing. And so what ends up happening is I think Yu-Gi-Oh!'s ban list has got a lot of cards on it where it's sort of in limbo. Like this card was definitely broken in 2011, but like would it actually really be a problem today? And we always find ourselves asking these questions like, you know, would Trap Dust Shoot be fine today? Would Pot of Greed be fine today? Could Mirage of Nightmare come off the ban list? What about Fishboard This or Mind Master or Magical Scientist or Fiber Jar? Or all these cards where like, we like to assume, oh yeah, it's way too broken to come off, but we've seen instances like say the Dragon Rulers where they come off the ban list and don't really end up doing anything. And so I actually think this whole Scorched Earth approach where we're like, okay, everything's just unbanned and you know, Darwinism will just find its way through might not be the worst thing because we could sort of see what strategies rise to the top and which ones we actually never had much reason to be concerned about from like the beginning. Not to say that, you know, I personally think, you know, Fiber Jar or Magical Scientist or whatever should be unbanned, but just that like, it'd be good to get kind of some modern day proof. So I agree with this take, thumbs up for me. The duels in the manga and anime were more fun and creative when there were no official rules. So this is actually, uh, mm, uh, okay. So the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime is pretty well known for not really following the rules, at least if we're looking back at things like, you know, Duel Monsters and GX. The recent Yu-Gi-Oh! anime is like Arc 5 and Brains actually do follow the rules pretty faithfully, I would say. However, I do think that that can sometimes make them a little bit harder to watch. I was watching episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh! Brains recently and it was kind of weird because like, they are doing a bunch of link summons and like summoning effects and I felt like it sort of took away from my investment because like they had to announce everything. It's like I activate Salamangrate this, and then it uses its effect to summon Salamangrate this, and then I link summon Salamangrate this and Salamangrate this and to make Salamangrate this. And then I'll like, you know, overlay this. And it was kind of like, hmm, I don't know if I actually really like watching it this way. Like I sometimes think that the original anime's charm was the fact that like a person could just top deck a monster and summon it. Are they breaking the rules whenever they just normal summon Guy the Fierce Knight and like attack? Yes, but I think that for a lot of us as kids, that made it more exciting to watch because the plays were simple and they were powerful. And like whenever somebody flipped the card, like a spell or a trap, it was exciting because like, you know, there weren't many things happening in a given turn. So it puts me in this weird, like I'm mixed. Uh, I think that it allows for more creativity in terms of like 
what you can show on screen when the games kind of are just BS, make up the rules as you go. But it really does not do a great job of like accurately portraying the game. So um, I'll give it a thumbs up because I do agree that this style works best for like TV and anime, but it's like with an asterisk, I guess. I don't know. Deck building for a big tournament takes more skill than playing the deck. Hmm. This is an interesting one. I am inclined to agree, I think that from at least my experience playing in, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments, regionals, and YCS events and stuff like that, deck building is easily the more stressful part for me. It's just really tough to kind of pinpoint exactly what you want your deck to do, but also like exactly what you expect the competition to be. And that can be really stressful. I know like, for instance, whenever I go to events with Trell, he always like finishes his deck list like the night before or like the morning of, and it's always kind of stresses me out because I, I always hate the thought of like, man, it, just, it seems hard to, to not have your deck list ironed down before then, but I totally get like how your brain could be moving a million miles a minute around like, what actually won you know this event or was doing well last weekend might not actually be doing well this weekend because like Yu-Gi-Oh, it, it's a moving target like it doesn't always stay the same the best deck for a weekend is only the best deck for that event that weekend and the next weekend everyone's anticipating this and that so i agree with this take i think it, it gets a thumbs up for me it is really tough to prepare for events and like deck build the game is at its most fun when playing just below the meta tier two and tier three maybe a few under uh, yeah, so I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game where, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! is pretty much fun as long as both people are playing at the same power level. So if you and your opponent are both playing the top meta deck or decks, then usually those matchups are going to be really fun, and you kind of both know what you're signing up for, right? Like, Snake Eye Dittos can be really exciting if, you know, you're both playing Snake Eyes. It's been this way for other top decks in the past, like Sky Strikers and Tier Limits. They all kind of were fun as long as the competition for them was like equally, it was like there, I think people enjoy that. But I do feel like Yu-Gi-Oh is at its least fun whenever there's like a big tier mismatch. Like a tier one deck playing against a tier four deck or something just usually isn't very good. But I do agree with this person that kind of that just underneath the meta level of deck power is really, really fun for me personally. A lot of my favorite decks like Vanquish Soul or Exo Sisters and Rescue Ace kind of exist in that realm. And I do enjoy them the most, especially when I'm playing against other decks that are right around that same power tier. So as long as you're playing in the same power tier as your opponent, it's pretty fun. So I'd say I agree with this. Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds has a peak theme song. I don't know why this is a hot take, it's just true. I think hand traps are actually a very interesting part of the game that gives it more unique gameplay compared to other TCGs. If only they were easy to get and were more focused on by Konami. Um, I don't entirely understand like the second part of this because I think that most hand traps are really easy to get, but I also agree with the first part, which is that hand traps do make Yu-Gi-Oh pretty unique. And I've honestly found that they've just become like a pretty fine part of the game. At first, I definitely was a little bit salty about just the idea that, you know, you've got like Ash Blossom and Ghost Ogre and Effect Baylor and all these things that negate everything you do. And don't get me wrong, there are still some really, you know, abrasive hand traps. I think Dimension Shifter kind of is like right up at the limit of what I think people really want out of a hand trap. And maybe in some cases, Nibiru could be that way too. I know if you play Master Duel, Maxi is obviously its own different story. But I do think that like hand traps are fine. I don't have like a big problem with any of them right now. I think that the beer is cool because it's like something that you have to kind of play around and it's sort of a form of skill expression and preparedness. I think that even the fact that people can play around Droll and Lockbird is pretty cool and shows that like there is dimension to hand traps and stuff like that. You know, which one you activate first. It's not always best to Ash Blossom if you have Imperm. Like maybe you should Imperm the monster, save the Ash for the Spell or Trap. I'm not saying they're the best thing in the world, but I actually have the can't jump to growing on me, so uh thumbs up again. I don't know if I'm ever gonna actually find one of these takes that I disagree with. A female protagonist would get people interested in playing with the game. Uh hmm. I mean I've certainly wanted a female Yu-Gi-Oh protagonist for ages. I think that it's a bit of a shame Konami hasn't done it, especially because we have like seven different Yu-Gi-Oh anime at this point. Like, come on, you've done it once. And yeah, I think people would really like it. I don't know if it would make people be like suddenly super interested in Yu-Gi-Oh, but I do think it's fun to see like anime where you typically get male protagonists, like say Gundam. I know like for anybody who watches Gundam, it's pretty much a series where the protagonist is always a guy and like sometimes we'll be like saving a girl or whatever. But the recent one, uh, The Witch from Mercury, actually had a female protagonist that ended up being one of the most popular Gundams, at least like in recent times. And so I don't know if like it would make Yu-Gi-Oh more popular, but I think it would just be a nice breath of fresh air. and. Maybe it would help to make, you know, people who see it, like if you're a girl and you see that, you might feel a little more welcomed or a little more empowered because 
Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't do right by the female characters very often. They usually, you know, don't either don't duel at all or they just lose a lot on screen. So uh, don't know if it would help Yu-Gi-Oh! be like more popular, but maybe it could. So sure, thumbs up. Anime archetypes should have the necessary support to always be the meta. I reckon it would aid with product advertising. Hmm, I've thought about this before, actually. So this is one where like, it's mostly a good take. Like, you know, the idea that Dark Magician and Blue Eyes and Cyber Dragons and Heroes are always pretty much the top of the meta. It would help because it would mean that like, Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't run into that weird advertising um, dilemma where it's like, hey, Yu-Gi and Kaiba are on everything and every little product, but also like their decks kind of suck and aren't really playable at the tournament level. Though I think people would get really, really sick and tired of seeing like Dark Magician and Blue Eyes actually being at the top tables and being the best decks because then it would feel like maybe there's a bias going on. I do agree that it would probably help with advertising if like literally the decks that you're playing are um, like that. But uh, while I won't say I like outright disagree with this take, I think that the better thing for Konami to do would just be to actually have faith in their own new kind of archetypes as like mascots and IP properties. Like that new anime sort of thing that they did in Japan where it's like the, the Chronicle series or whatever, Chronicle Saga. I want to see more of that. I want to see Albaz and Ecclesia and Diabell Star and the Six Samurai or the Melfi monsters kind of get more like actual advertising where they become the mascots of this game instead of just leaning on Yugi and Kaiba the whole time. The video games featuring a point in time slice of the game are more fun than constantly learning new archetypes which shift every few years. Uh, yeah, so I think what this person's saying is basically like if you play maybe some of the old Tag Force games or some of the like Legacy of the Duelist games or something where it's kind of just the snapshot format, that that's kind of a better way to play Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, 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 uh. I don't know that I agree like entirely, but I totally get what they're saying. Like it's sometimes nice to be able to go back to an old Yu-Gi-Oh game and just be like, man. <sighs> It's nice to not have to deal with a billion different archetypes and a billion different mechanics and just sort of focus on this one thing. I know there was a period of time where I actually used the Yu-Gi-Oh! Tag Force games as a way to play test around like, I wanna say like 2010 or so, 2011. It was cool because they would sometimes have like OCG card pools at the time. And so you could actually like generally like play pretty well like with the modern game and it could be like a fun way to play test. So that's something that I did. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's a fine take. It gets a uh, sideways thumb for me. A good nine out of the 10 solutions to fix the game proposed by the community are awful and create a brand new series of problems. Uh, yeah, 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 I think this is true. I uh, I say this as somebody who oftentimes is outspoken about like, here's how Yu-Gi-Oh could fix the game or here's how Yu-Gi-Oh could fix the game. The truth is none of us really know what we're talking about. Like not for the most part, we just don't. A lot of times what people want on the ban list is for every deck but their deck to get hit or they get angry when their deck gets hit but also they sort of feel like the best decks should be the ones that like get the worst treatment or you know i've heard these things like Yu-Gi-Oh should only allow three special summons per turn but then like what happens to decks that are not broken like black wings but still maybe need more than three summons or you know some people say like both players should start with twenty thousand life points or the person who goes first should draw only three or four cards like just all these things where i totally get it we're trying to kind of brute force solutions to problems that have just slowly crept up on us over the years where like going first is really busted turns take a long time special summons can feel overwhelming but i think that by and large there's a reason why you Gil hasn't made any like sweeping changes and it's because truthfully most of them would be really hard to implement and like really unfair and some of the few times that konami has tried to do formats like this because they have tried them in the past they aren't really very well received by players so uh man i don't know i do think though that like Yu-Gi-Oh needs changes i just think that like alternate formats are typically the answer as opposed to like trying to change the base game in some way the biggest problem with classic formats like Goat and Edison is that there's no new things. Of course, you can experiment here and there, but you can't have the experience of opening a new set and testing to see how these cards can come together on a new deck. The excitement over new things is important. Yes, totally, 100%, fully agree with this take. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why I'm not really a big fan of the Goat and Edison format. I don't hate them. I don't dissuade anybody from trying them. It's nothing, like, there's nothing wrong with them, like, if you like them. But for me, I just don't really care to not be able to play new decks. Like for me, I want a place where I can play my Magic E deck or my Dual Avatar deck and not just get completely run over by Snake Eyes or Kashira or whatever the hot new deck is at the time. In like, I can't do that in Edison format. Edison format's cool and it's fun to kind of innovate on a seemingly snapshot format that seems stalled, but actually like people are finding a lot more depth in it. That's cool. 
It's just that you can never actually get new cards. The card pool never expands and changes. And so like in that way, it means that new sets and stuff are just walled off from you and that's no fun. So I don't think like, you know, down with GOAT format, down with Edison, but just more like, um, I would like a low power sort of or like mid-level format in the modern day so I can play like the new stuff too. They need to explain why cards are being added, removed, or moved to different tiers of the Forbidden Limited list whenever it updates. Even if it's obvious, I need them to say their reasoning. Uh, I don't think this is a particularly hot take, but I do think that it's true. I mean, I, I totally agree. I would love to have some patch notes in this game. Konami, that said, I think Konami has not good reason not to do it, but I think I see why they probably don't, which is just that like the Yu-Gi-Oh community is outspoken and if they were to give a certain reason for why a card moved or got banned, then people would kind of take that reason, extrapolate it, do some mental gymnastics and be like, oh, so you said you hit this card because it causes this problem. Well, what about this card that causes the same problem? And then it would just sort of be like, people would be like arguing back and forth and being like, oh, Konami's, you know, they're being hypocrites because they hit this but not this and they said this and they don't even know what they're talking about. So it might just be easier for Konami to not really say much of anything at all. Still though, I wish that they would. It just feels like a little bit antiquated in like 2024 where we've got all these like live service games and stuff where like characters get patched and changed all the time. And like there's usually an explanation or a developer diary that comes with it. And like in Yu-Gi-Oh we get nothing. But I think that the middle ground that I'd be willing to settle for is at least just getting to know when ban lists are going to happen. That would be really good. Konami, please and thank you, give us ban list dates. OCG, TCG, and card releases should be one and the same. The reasons for the separation at this point are arbitrary at best. We're playing the exact same card game here. Uh, yeah, I would like the OCG and the TCG and everything else to just kind of synergize. Like, you know, having the same release dates is something that a lot more card games have been doing. Like, I remember when like Digimon got this earlier this year, but also like just video games in general. Like, I remember like there's a period of time where Pokemon games would be released early in Japan, like sometimes like six, three, six months in advance, and they get spoiled when they come over here. And it's really tough to like play the TCG sometimes because it's like, you know what's on the horizon. Like Legacy of Destruction just released, but we already know a lot of the cards that are in the next set, the Infinite Forbidden. And soon we'll know the cards that are in like the next set after that. And it can just kind of be like tricky, especially because like different cards get imported into the TCG in different ways. So like something that came from the Pride or Unity set in Japan gets in, gets put in like this year's tin of Dueling Mirrors or whatever. And it can just be like really tough to follow. And I think it would just be better if we all just kind of on the same page. I'm sure Konami has their reasons, but I, I would just like it. So yeah, I, thumbs up, I agree. Yu-Gi-Oh! needs more spin-off games that don't pertain solely to the TCG. There should be dice monsters, capsule monsters, there should be RPGs, and even creature collecting games. The TCG holds Yu-Gi-Oh! back. Ooh, hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I think I agree. I've actually been playing a lot of old school Yu-Gi-Oh! video games, like the Dark Duel Stories, Sacred Cards, Capsule Monster Coliseum, and like all these different games. Uh, and it, it's certainly shown me that Yu-Gi-Oh! can work well in other genres. I think that it does suck when like, it feels like we're just limited to just being a card game simulator. Don't get me wrong, Master Duel, amazing. Duel Links, great. Like good games, they're fun. But I think that it's also nice to have like a game like Yu-Gi-Oh! 5 Ds Wheelie Breakers where like, you know, you race in the motorcycle. It's like a kart racer style game or people always talk about Duelist of the Roses and it feels like Yu-Gi-Oh! has lost some willingness to explore. However, the counterpoint I'll raise is when they did try something different, like with Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Duel, it just wasn't really well received. That's not to say that game didn't have its own set of problems in terms of like marketing and like microtransactions and things like that. But it's definitely something where I think Konami is a little bit concerned about like whether or not these games will stick, whether or not it's worth kind of the development costs. The gaming industry I know is like, it's really rough. A lot of game companies are having trouble, like you know, there's like layoffs and stuff and games don't always sell well. But I think maybe you, what you maybe do is like, okay, take Yu-Gi-Oh! and outsource it to like smaller studios and have them kind of make these one-off spin-off games that are like puzzle games or RPGs or something. Like I was playing the Sacred Cards for Game Boy and like it literally plays kind of like how an old school like over-the-top RPG goes where like you run around, you have a character and a sprite in an overworld. And yeah, you still duel, but at least there's like a story and an RPG element there. And so I would love to see Yu-Gi-Oh! explore more of that. Yu-Gi-Oh! is beyond saving at this point. Konami will keep fleecing TTG players without any repercussions because some people are masochists. Unironically, playing Yu-Gi-Oh! should be a meme at this point. If you, <laughs> if you actually like the game as it is right now in any way, you're no better than a League of Legends player. Just free yourself at this point. Or don't, it's your life. 
Corporations will always have something to reel you back in, but if they don't fix the core issues of the game or product, they will have problems. Oh man, okay, this one really uh, went for the jugular. Uh, ooh, uh. I, okay, I don't want to go so far as to say Yu-Gi-Oh is beyond saving. I know that this is like a narrative that comes up a lot and it's kind of, you know, ironic coming from me because I, I complain a lot or whatever. But I think Yu-Gi-Oh is just a game where at this point, you gotta kind of accept what it is, right? And so what that means is, Konami's not gonna be able to magically fix the game with any particular thing. They can change the way that like set rarities work and they can change the way that the ban list is approached or you know, they can try to do this or try to do that, but nothing's gonna please everybody. What I've found myself thinking a lot more and telling people is, Yu-Gi-Oh is a game where you gotta kind of find your own fun, right? Like if you don't like the way the modern game is, then try out GOAT, try out Edison, try out Domain Format, try out Trinity Format, make up something fun that you can just play with your friends at the kitchen table and have some fun with that. Or, you know, like, just lose yourself in other parts of the IP. Play some old school games, like play those old Yu-Gi-Oh! Tag Force games or the, you know, World Championship games or something else. Like, you gotta kind of find your own fun in Yu-Gi-Oh! Find your own way to play that you stubbornly stick to. Find decks that you want to kind of push their absolute limit and or just play speed duels unless you're in Europe, I guess. Play, you know, what I, I think relying on Konami to fix things and like find happiness in the game, like being at the mercy of a company that, you know, they, they, they've got a prerogative. They're gonna kind of just keep pushing the way they're pushing. Uh, I don't know. I'm not like, I won't agree that the game is like beyond salvation. I think that there's like a lot of things Konami could do to improve the situation, but Nothing's gonna make everybody happy, so uh, just find your own happiness in Yu-Gi-Oh. It's the best thing I can say. Okay, so that's all of the good hot takes, at least the ones that got lots of likes. Uh, I think that these were all really good. It's a little unfortunate that I ended up more or less just agreeing with them. So maybe next time we should go for you know more extreme ones, right? Like I wanna hear something that's even worse, even crazier. Leave it down below in the comments and uh, let me know what you thought about any of these hot takes or any other hot takes that you have or anything else. I don't know, tell me how the weather is, whatever. Subscribe, I'll see you guys in the next video. Past turn.